Cameron, subtitled Principe Galeotto. By Giovanni Boccaccio. First day, story four, read by Nigel Planer. In the not very remote district of Lunigiana, there once flourished a community of monks more numerous and holy than can be found there today. Among them was a young brother whose vigour and lustihood neither the fasts nor the vigils were able to subdue. One afternoon, while the rest of the brotherhood slept, our young monk took a stroll around the church, which lay in a very sequestered spot, and chanced to espy a young and very beautiful girl a daughter, perhaps, of one of the husbandmen of those parts, going through the fields and gathering herbs as she went. No sooner had he seen her than he was sharply assailed by a carnal desire, so much so that he approached her and addressed her, and, she hearkening, little by little they came to an understanding, and, unobserved by any, entered his cell together. Now, by chance, while they fooled about inside somewhat recklessly, he being overwrought with passion, the abbot awoke, and, passing slowly by the young monk's cell, heard the noise they were making, and in order to distinguish their voices, came softly up to the door of the cell, and listening, discovered that without doubt one of the voices belonged to a woman. His first thought was to force the door open, but changing his mind, he returned to his chamber and waited until the monk came out. Ecstatic beyond belief though the monk was as a result of his intercourse with the girl, he was not altogether without anxiety. He had heard, as he thought, the sound of footsteps in the dormitory, and having peered through a convenient aperture, he had a good view of the abbot as he stood by the door listening. He was thus fully aware that the abbot might have detected the presence of a woman in the cell so he was exceedingly distressed, knowing that he would receive a severe punishment. But he concealed his concerns from the girl while he busily thought of some way of escape from his embarrassment. He thus hit on a novel stratagem which was exactly suited to his purpose. With the air of one who had had enough of the girl's company, he said to her, "'I shall now leave you in order that I may arrange for your departure unobserved. Stay here quietly until I return.' So out he went, locking the door of the cell and withdrawing the key, which he carried straight to the abbot's chamber and handed to him, as was the custom when a monk was going out, saying with a composed air, Sir, I was not able this morning to bring in all the faggots which I had made ready, so with your leave I will go to the wood and bring them in. The abbot, desiring to have a better knowledge of the monk's offence, and unaware that the monk knew that he had been detected, was pleased with the turn events were taking, and received the key gladly, at the same time giving the monk his desired leave. So the monk went, and the abbot began to consider what course it was best for him to take, whether to assemble the brotherhood and open the door in their presence, so, being witnesses of the delinquency, they would have no cause to murmur against him when he proceeded to punish the monk or whether it was not better first to learn from the girl's own lips how it had come about. And reflecting that she might be the wife or daughter of some man who would be upset that she should be shamed by being exposed to the gaze of all the monks, he decided first of all to find out who she was, and then to make up his mind. So he went softly to the cell, opened the door, and, having entered, closed it behind him. The girl, seeing that her visitor was none other than the abbot, quite lost her presence of mind, and, quaking with shame, began to weep. Master Abbot surveyed her from head to foot, and, seeing that she was fresh and comely, fell a prey, old though he was, to fleshly cravings no less poignant and sudden than those which the young monk had experienced, and began thus to commune with himself. Alas, why not take my pleasure when I can, seeing that on many lack occasions I have trouble and, and a vexation of spirit? Here is a fair wench, and no one in the world need know. If I can bring her to pleasure me, I know not why I should not do so. Who will know? No one will ever know. And sin that is hidden is half forgiven. 
this chance may never come again. So I think it is wise for me to take the opportunity which God provides. So musing, with an altogether different purpose from that with which he had come, he drew near the girl and softly bade her to be comforted, and besought her not to weep. And so, little by little, he came at last to show her what he wanted to do. The girl, being made neither of iron nor of steel, was happy to gratify the abbot, who, after bestowing upon her many an embrace and kiss, got upon the monk's bed, where, being aware perhaps of the disparity between his reverence...